This photograph of Queen Victoria's two grandsons was taken in the early 1870s. The boy on the right would grow up to become King George V and rule for 25 years. The boy on the left, Prince Eddie, was the elder and heir to the throne. But Eddie died and became the king we never had. Who was Prince Eddie? Great uncle of our present queen, and yet the royal family never talk about him. He died in 1892, and in the years since, his reputation has become tarnished. Eddie, they said, was slow, self-indulgent, heedless, and even not punctual. Worse was to come. I think he very much turns into this blank slate that people can project all sorts of fantasies. You can think, oh, you know, he wasn't just dissipated, he was really evil, he was corrupt, you know, he was the absolute image of the licentious aristocrats. The prince became a cipher for the dark and decadent side of Victorian life. Rumoured to be involved in a notorious sex scandal and eventually even accused of being Jack the Ripper, Eddie's reputation grew horns and a tail. But did his early death really save Britain from a monster, or did it cheat us of a good king? Luton Hoo, now empty and fallen into disrepair, the palace was once the home of the Danish ambassador and the venue for many grand house parties. One of the last pictures we have of Prince Eddie was taken here in 1891. Historian Andrew Cook was cataloguing glass negatives at a museum when he came across a photograph of Prince Eddie and Princess May, the woman he was to marry. The photograph shows the happy couple, the future king and queen, at Luton Hoo on the day their engagement was announced. Yet within weeks, Eddie would be dead, and Princess May would go on to marry his younger brother, George. I began to look into his life. I started to read books that other people had written. The further I looked into it, the worse his, his character seemed to be. And uh, it just really struck me that, you know, was this the case or, or was there more to find out really? And I, I just really felt the need to, to go deeper into the story. Andrew Cook sought the authentic voice of his subject, the Prince's diaries or correspondence. But Eddie died young and the royal family destroyed all his personal papers. Cook, however, kept searching believing that something must have survived. For a very long time, the view has been that Eddie's correspondence no longer existed. However, it struck me that the letters that he sent to individuals that he knew, they would almost certainly have kept them. If only I could trace people that he had written to, I could unearth his correspondence. Eddie, it seemed, had been very close to his cousin, Prince Louis of Battenberg, the father of Lord Mountbatten. And over a hundred years after they were written, Eddie's letters are rediscovered. These letters are in remarkable condition, bearing in mind their age. Uh, the ink has barely faded. A variety of seals from Cambridge University, Sandringham. These are a marvellous opportunity to find out more about Eddie as a person through these uh, very intimate letters. My dear Louis, it was very good of you and Victoria to send me such a charming present for my birthday, for which I thank you both very much. You may be sure it will remind me of our long cruise together. Friedensborg, I am certain, as certain as most people are who are in love with a girl, that I could make her happy if she would only give me a chance of doing so. Cambridge, the next morning at 7.30, beastly cold, we went to Wellington Barracks to see the foot guards off. It was a sad and painful sight to see their poor wives taking leave of them, a thing I dislike more than anything. These letters were really personal with a capital P. He was talking about his own emotions, his own feelings, his own outlook on life, and they were really, for want of a better word, confessional letters, and, and they really did give a very major insight in, into, into his soul.
It was the height of empire, but a troubled time for the monarchy when Albert Victor Christian Edward, the first son of the Prince and Princess of Wales, was born. Two months premature and weighing less than four pounds, the second in line to the throne was nonetheless strong and healthy. Although he would always be known as Eddie, he was christened Albert by decree of Queen Victoria. Then aged just 45, she had lost her own beloved prince three years before and consulted the dead consort on every matter. The royal family was quite unpopular at the time he was born. Victoria was still working through her grief issues over the death of Prince Albert. The Prince of Wales was regarded as very raffish and dissipated. He was not a popular figure at that time. Eddie was soon followed by brother George and several sisters. Grandmother might never approve, but their loving parents would spoil them rotten. They lived a very open and progressive lifestyle as, as opposed to what you would expect of, of children at the time. In fact, Queen Victoria quote, was quoted on more than one occasion as saying that they were running wild. The Waleses lived at Marlborough House in the Mole, where far from Victoria's withering gaze, the Prince of Wales had begun to attract a bohemian coterie to his London court. The man who would one day be crowned Edward VII was nicknamed King Tum Tum. The Prince of Wales was a libertine. His idea of a really good day was to eat too much, to drink too much, to massacre a few birds, to gamble for high stakes, to fornicate, then to start hoping over again next day. Eddie was just six when he had his first brush with scandal. In 1870, his father was forced to give evidence in the divorce of one of his many mistresses. At a time when divorce was the rare luxury of the upper classes, being summoned to court was enough to confirm to the public that the prince was a philanderer. There's a distinction to be made between Victoria, who has tried to establish what she represents in terms of middle class values and the family, and a bunch of um, privileged aristocrats running around enjoying themselves. You see her talking about young Prince Eddie and sort of saying, oh, you know, we don't want him to go the same way as others. Eddie's grandmother decided that something must be done. But the man she would appoint to look after the princes would begin the slander that has haunted Prince Eddie to this day. In 1871, the Prince of Wales was universally regarded as dissipated a suitably Victorian word to describe someone who lived life to the full. So the Queen decided that Prince Eddie and his brother George needed a more sober influence. She appointed as their tutor the Reverend John Neil Dalton. A man of total probity, decency up to a point, staggering dullness, a complete inability to in any way interest his charges in the subjects they were studying and a man of a visible, gruesome tediousness. Dalton, who was very ambitious but no teacher, tamed the wild princes, devising a rigorous schedule of what he considered essential for their royal education, and bored them stiff. I think Dalton's influence is not a good one. He's a dull martinet um, who's obsessively uh, interested in guarding his two charges. But the boys stubbornly refused to acquire even the most basic education. Possibly to cover up for his failings as a teacher, Dalton complained. Eddie, he said, was... Apathetic, with an abnormally dormant condition of mind. He was the prince's first libeler. Dalton effectively sows the seed of doubt in terms of Eddie's uh, academic abilities, and other people have literally taken this and... and Built, built a great deal more on these very modest foundations. Brother George was equally hopeless, but the boy who became King George V has had his story subtly rewritten. He's often writing or giving interviews late in life when George V is king and Eddie is long dead, so I think he's keen to yeah, manufacture an image where he, he's created the monarch. 
In 1877, Eddie reached 13, when most boys of his age and class would have been expected to start at public school. That, however, was not the royal way. The royal family, certainly ever since the days of the sailor king, King William IV, have always had this curious illusion that the best way to train an heir to the throne was to send him to sea. It doesn't seem to me to be the ideal training for somebody who's got to play a role in the running of a country. Nonetheless, off to sea they went. With the Reverend Dalton in tow as ship's chaplain, Princes Eddie and George sailed on the training ship HMS Britannia as sea cadets. Despite undertaking nautical training, their lives remained as constrained as ever. Both princes are kept away um, from frequent contact with their fellow officers. They're told not to confide anything from home, any sort of personal reminiscences. So it's actually very dull. Dull appeals to Prince George. That's what George V likes. Dull doesn't appeal to Eddie. Eddie, however, had plenty of time to get used to it. All in all, the two boys and their tutor would spend the next five years at sea, far away from the scandals at home. But in the summer of 1879 at Cowes, Eddie met Lily Langtree, the Prince of Wales' latest mistress. Lily's stage career had yet to begin, but as a noted society beauty, her face was featured on a million Victorian postcards. It seems that young Eddie, like his father, developed a bit of a crush. Being in Cowes when the two princes set off in the Bacante for a voyage around the world, I gave a small trinket as a souvenir to the Duke of Clarence. The next day, he showed it to me on his watch chain, saying I had to take off my grandmother's locket to make room for it. In 1881, the princes dropped anchor in Australia. Until now, the only record we've had of their voyage was John Dalton's extensive but dreary account which he claimed was based upon the boys' diaries. Andrew Cook, however, found other sources and a very different view. What I decided to do was to go back to square one to actually dig up all the press reports on the tour that still exist in archives in Australia. And these reports actually gave a very different perspective to the sort of dry and regimented views and accounts that Dalton himself gave. Prince Albert Victor, the elder, stands nearly four inches higher than his brother and is a fair-haired, intelligent-looking youth bearing a striking resemblance to his uncle. They are two pleasant-looking, gentlemanly lads and sit their horses in a manner that might be advantageously copied by many a young colonial. Prince Albert Victor declared the stone well and truly laid and called for three cheers for the club. Cheers were also given for the Queen and the Princes. The Royal Highnesses were elected honorary members. These long ignored accounts show that the Australian tour was a genuine success. It was Prince Eddie, and not his shy younger brother, who stole the show. Eddie responds very well in countries that are by nature critical or skeptical of British authority. He seems to have this great empathy with ordinary Australian people and they warm very much to his character and the type of message that he's bringing. On the way back to England, they stopped in Japan and got matching tattoos. But at home in 1883, the boys were finally parted. George would remain in the Navy while Prince Eddie was to go up to Cambridge becoming the first prince to attend university. His tutor's initial impression wasn't good. I do not think he can possibly much benefit from attending lectures at Cambridge. He hardly knows the meaning of the words to read. Eddie enjoyed occasional lectures in history and English literature, but like many of his class, he was quite properly excused exams. The prince was sporting enough, just like any member of the royal family, but he also got thoroughly involved in undergraduate life. I think it must have been a revelation to Eddie to go up to Cambridge in 1883. He, he meets artists, he meets writers, he's introduced to a, a, a wide variety of people through the Cambridge set. We know that he was a member of the Pitt Club at Cambridge, that he exchanged political views with other students, that he really took advantage of that whole experience really to widen his perspective. George, on the other hand, 
went into the Navy, had a very narrow outlook on life as a whole, Eddie's outlook from Cambridge onwards was a much wider and richer one, I think. The most divisive issue of the 1880s was the subject of Home Rule for Ireland. Violence was in the air, and the Irish question was tearing the political elite apart. Cook has found evidence that Prince Eddie had his own firm opinions on this extremely sensitive matter. When a Cambridge friend sent him some verses strongly in favour of Home Rule, Eddie replied, I thought the poems you've sent me very good, and they certainly do you credit, as they are only too true. It shows that he was quite a radical free thinker, especially for a uh, royal at the time. This is something that, of course, he'd never be able to say in public under any circumstances. Even to think it was pretty impressive, in a sense. Queen Victoria heartily disliked Gladstone's espousal of Irish home rule. So Eddie is playing with sort of pol political ideas that, that most other members of the royal family wouldn't touch with a barge pole. Cambridge at that time was the centre of the new aesthetic movement, the cult of Greek love and pleasure for pleasure's sake. And it's here that Prince Eddie begins to acquire a reputation for sexual ambiguity. Eddie's all-male circle of friends included some who, by today's standards, would describe themselves as gay. It's very difficult to talk about a Prince Eddie knowing lots of gay men because neither Prince Eddie nor these men would have conceived of themselves in those terms and I think what one has to remember is that Eddie was passing through a very homosocial environment Now that's not quite the same thing as a homosexual environment so yes I'm sure lots of these men were having sex with each other but it wasn't necessarily the case that they were seeing themselves as having an identity around that I think he's like a kid in a sweet factory and he's someone who does go to, to, to clubs, he goes to transvestite clubs. Well, all the upper classes do that. That's what you do when you go to Cambridge. In January 1885, invitations were issued for Eddie's 21st birthday party at Sandringham. After all the dull years spent at sea, he was now on the cusp of public life. My dear Louis, I was very sorry that neither you nor Victoria could come here for the festive week as we really had a pleasant party. Strange to say, all the relations got on wonderfully well together and everything went off without a hitch. But for Eddie, even a birthday party meant duties to perform. Amongst the 1,000 distinguished guests were speakers representing the local authorities of Norwich and Kings Lynn. I had no end of addresses and deputations to receive and I think it would have amused you to have heard some of them as several of the old fogies could hardly read a word from nervousness. I must say I felt a bit nervous myself at first, but it gradually passed off. Eddie was very much a late developer. From the age of 20, 21, he's gradually taking on the mantle of the heir presumptive to the throne, even the heir to the throne. In 1885, Prince Eddie said goodbye to his carefree university days and came to London. Eddie was to join the highly fashionable 10th Hussars. It had been his father's regiment, and just like the Prince of Wales, Eddie clearly had a fondness for uniform. The army, however, had an image problem. There's a long tradition of cavalrymen as being particularly given to, well, wine, women and song. There would be drinking, gambling, high-class prostitutes and courtesans all sorts of haunts of vice and depravity that they would go to where there would be various kinds of well the things like pose plastique which are sort of women around in scanty dress doing um, scenes from classical literature and so on when in mufti eddie became a masher wearing the trademark high collar of the fashionable young man about town his nickname was collars and cuffs for the rich, these were decadent days. The Duke of Manchester had even moved in with music hall star Bessie Bellwood. London at the end of the 19th century is the largest city in the world. It's a vast metropolis. It's a place of ambiguity, uncertainty. The West End is a huge kind of pleasure playground for the wealthy. Prince Eddie was making the most of it. He had a girl in St John's Wood who he shared with his brother. George described her in his diary as... A ripper. 
There will be various kinds of entertainment available of a raffish nature. He was leading a life of dissipation, if not actual depravity. In the late summer of 1888, all of London became obsessed with a series of grisly murders in the East End. The popular press reveled in the rampage of a killer they dubbed Jack the Ripper, and soon everyone was talking about it. Even the Queen. This new most ghastly murder shows the absolute necessity for some very decided action. All these courts must be lit and our detectives improved. They are not what they should be. But Prince Eddie had other things on his mind. The prince was now a captain and had begun performing public engagements regularly. He opened the splendid new Hammersmith Bridge and letters to his cousin reveal that Eddie was falling in love. In the hope of making a match, Victoria had invited the 16-year-old German Princess Alex of Hesse to Balmoral. Her plan worked and Eddie was smitten. Alec is still here and is much grown. She's looking prettier than ever and will, I'm sure, be very handsome when she grows up. The New York Times reported rumors that handsome Prince Albert Victor, collars and cuffs, might be about to marry his cousin, Princess Victoria of Prussia. They were wrong. Eddie was in love, but with a different German cousin. My dear Louis, I thought you knew I was fond of Alecky. I did not give her the slightest sign that I loved her, although inwardly I was longing to tell her so, but thought I'd better wait my time. But while Prince Eddie was still hopelessly in love with Princess Alex, somewhere else in the city, a scandal was about to erupt which would forever stain his reputation. There were two Victorian worlds. There was the Victorian world that the Victorians liked to imagine. Underneath this virtuous exterior was a highly sordid, impoverished, dark, bleak underbelly. Parallels were drawn to Rome and the fall of Rome, and the idea that, they, that, that, that the culture had become too decadent. Um, and this really was most visible, if you like, in the, in the West End of London. The worst fears of the middle classes were soon to be realized, as the goings-on at a West One terrace shook the very foundations of Victorian society. In the decadent days of 1889, Eddie's father, the Prince of Wales, was known as a womanizer and a gambler. His affairs were tolerated. But if a member of the royal family were linked in any way with homosexuality, then there really would be a scandal. It all began at post office headquarters. Telegram boys weren't allowed to carry cash, so when young Charlie Swinscoe was found with 18 shillings, one and a half times his weekly wage, the police suspected theft. Charlie finally admitted that he'd been paid for sex with a gentleman at a house in Fitzrovia. Other boys were interviewed, and it soon emerged that number 19 Cleveland Street was the center of a network of male prostitution. Cleveland Street was a house of assignation. You could go there and a boy would be provided for you to have sex with, but you could also go there and take someone that you'd picked up in the street to have sex with for a fee. Inspector Aberline of Scotland Yard was taken off the Ripper investigation and told to clear up Cleveland Street. His interrogations revealed that amongst the regulars at number 19 were two MPs, an Earl, and this man, Lord Arthur Somerset, equerry to the Prince of Wales, known to his friends as Podge. It was the hottest potato. Here you had supposedly pillars of the empire, you know, visiting a male brothel, you know, and, um, and, and fooling around with working class lads. You know, they, they were not only crossing sexual boundaries, they were also crossing class boundaries. Whereas any homosexual act was a serious offence, punishment for the high-born customers of Cleveland Street would risk upsetting the social order. Lord Somerset's wily solicitor, Arthur Newton, knew it and sought to play on the establishment's fears. Newton made it clear that should his client be charged, then someone even higher than a lord would be dragged into the scandal. 
I'm told that Newton has boasted that if we go on, a very distinguished person will be involved. P.A.V. He never actually names Prince Eddie. What he does is put in brackets P.A.V., which means Prince Albert Victor. He was quick to say in his letter that he didn't actually credit it for an instant, but he couldn't take the risk that the name of Prince Eddie wouldn't be dragged into open court and solid. The minor players were charged with procuring to commit acts of gross indecency and conspiracy to commit buggery. But there was still no warrant for Somerset's arrest. I think just the fact that Prince Albert Victor's name had begun to be um, associated with the case was enough. Whether or not he'd got, he was going to the bottle or not, in a way, even the, even the, the rumour had to be quashed. The prince left England in October, bound for a grand tour of India. Some biographers have claimed he was bundled out of the country to escape the scandal. There was no possibility that the Indian trip was, was set up so to get Prince Eddie out of the country. And they may have wanted Prince Eddie out of the country, but it wouldn't have been anything at all to do with any sexual scandal. It would just be that um, it might possibly do him some good. At home, his name was at the very centre of a scandal. But Eddie's newly discovered letters to his cousin indicate the prince was blissfully unaware still obsessed with his German princess. I can't really believe Alaki knows how much I really love her, or she would not, I think, have treated me quite so cruelly, for I can't help considering it so, as she apparently gives me no chance at all, and little or no hope. While Eddie made his lovelorn but stately progress around the subcontinent, shooting with Maharajas, at home, a classic Victorian cover-up was ordered. The postboys got off with light sentences, and others were encouraged to flee the country, all with hardly a mention in the press. The Prince of Wales pulled strings, and the Prime Minister, Lord Salisbury, obeyed. He made sure that Somerset, the man who could implicate Eddie, would never appear in court. What one has to remember is that the Victorians were very often not so totally straight-laced as we like to think. They knew that homosexuality existed in uh, upper-class circles. They just didn't want anybody particularly to know about it. And when somebody was caught, like Arthur Somerset was, they wanted to give him a chance to skip the country. And that's all that the Prime Minister did, totally illegally, of course. He was not only allowed to escape, he was allowed to come home for his mother's funeral and they still didn't arrest him and he uh, was able to escape to the continent again from where he never returned. With Somerset safely in exile, it would be several years before rumours about Eddie and Cleveland Street surfaced in public. But did the prince ever go to the infamous number 19? If he didn't, what did Somerset hope to achieve by accusing him? It's only when you start to look at the precarious position that Somerset was in, you look at his legal representatives, you look at their track record, the tactics that they've used, it's not really surprising that these kind of innuendos are introduced into his defence. Arthur Newton is the man who appears to have really fabricated uh, the link uh, with Prince Eddie. If you're looking for anyone in, in the royal family, Eddie's obviously the, the, the easiest target. And then, of course, when you throw mud, it sticks. And Eddie's now labelled as the, you know, the sexually ambivalent guy who went to male brothels. Meanwhile, somewhere in India... Grandmama was extremely nice about it all. For, as you know, she was always in favour of a union between me and Alaki. Perhaps you might be able to find out if there is any real reason why Alaki does not care for me and if I've offended her in any way. When Eddie finally returned from India, he discovered the true cause of Alaki's indifference. She had visited Russia and danced with the young Tsarevich Nicholas. It was him she would marry. The news that Alex had said yes to the future Tsar prompted the Prince of Wales to begin drawing up a list of possible brides for his son. As long as he remained single, Eddie would be vulnerable to scandal. He had to be married, and married soon. You have a wild young man. He's going to be the monarch one day. You want to settle him down. You want to get him married before he has made unfortunate connections. 
there's something of a royal cattle market about the marriages of, uh, of princes to princesses all the way through this period. You can spot even 15 years before who's likely to come up, who's going to be good, who's likely to be a mistake. And Eddie managed to become besotted with just about the most unsuitable princess he could possibly find. Hélène, the daughter of the Comte de Paris, Duke d'Orléans. She's French, she's a Catholic, and she is the descendant of one of the pretenders to the French throne, which is diplomatically an extremely dodgy family to be marrying into at the time of the Third Republic, when you're supposed to be on good terms with the French. It was something that they um, both believed could happen. It was something that even Queen Victoria, who had a very good political um, head on her shoulders, also seemed to be um, promoting. But not for a moment were they going to get it past the Prime Minister. At one point, Prince Eddie even threatened to renounce his claim to the throne for Hélène. But her father said no, and even an appeal to the Pope failed. Soon he was enamoured of another unsuitable girl, the very beautiful but very common Sybil Erskine. Eddie knew discretion was a must, as the Prince of Wales' spies were everywhere. Darling, I wonder if you really love me a little. I ought not to ask such a silly question, I suppose, but still I should be very pleased if you did. You may trust me not to show your letters to anyone. You can't be too careful what you do in these days when hardly anyone is to be trusted. A princess who plumped for the Tsar, a French Catholic pretender, and even a British commoner. Eddie's affections were rarely in tune with what was required from an heir to the throne. The Prince of Wales had had scandal enough that year without his son's difficulties, and he decided that unless Eddie could be married, he should be banished to the colonies. His mother, however, couldn't bear the thought of losing Eddie again, and determined that this time a bride would be found for him. There wasn't a particularly strong cast of German princesses available at that time, and they were scraping a barrel a bit when they got to the Tech family. Nevertheless, Queen Victoria satisfied herself that Princess May was a thoroughly sensible, decent girl. She'll do Eddie a great deal of good. Eddie obediently agreed, and that December at a house party, Julie popped the question. Princess May said yes, of course, but the somewhat resigned tone of a newly discovered letter to his cousin reveals that for Eddie, this wasn't quite true love. My dear Louis, I wonder if you were surprised when you saw I was engaged. I dare say you were, for I must say I made up my mind rather suddenly, which I think, however, was the best thing after all. And it is really time I thought of getting married, if I'm ever to be. Anyway, it is now settled at last. The couple enjoyed two weeks in London, shopping and going to the theatre. It was almost Christmas and the crowds greeted them warmly, cheering wherever they went. Things were finally looking up for Eddie. At Hatfield, the home of the Prime Minister, Lord Salisbury, Andrew Cook discovered correspondence which indicates Eddie was also being considered for an important political role. It's a revelation that finally quashes the myth of the Prince's intelligence, or rather, the lack of it. I went to the archives at Hatfield House and I was studying this correspondence that passed between the Prime Minister and the Prince of Wales. And the revelation I came across there was that Eddie was actually being put forward as the next Viceroy of Ireland. It was a highly symbolic position, but in troubled times, an important one. The Nationalists were still pressing for home rule, and their violent campaign of disobedience had led to an equally robust response from the British government. The Dublin commander thought Eddie was the man to calm the situation, and Lord Salisbury agreed. I simply do not believe that any responsible statesman who knew for the future of this very turbulent island depended upon the right man being in that slot, in a job which called for a great deal of finesse and moral courage and determination. It would be disastrous for Ireland and disastrous for him. It's one of the marvellous what-ifs. What if he had been made Viceroy of Ireland? We've detected pro-home rule sympathies. He could have found himself in a marvellous role. 
one which his father later enjoyed as, as king in terms of building bridges with France. Well, Eddie could have been exactly the right person to build bridges with Irish home rule and perhaps effect a peaceful transition. Who knows? What if? Prince Eddie spent Christmas at Sandringham, and Princess May arrived soon in the new year to continue making arrangements for their wedding. But on his 28th birthday, Eddie fell ill, victim of the deadly flu epidemic that had been raging in Britain for a year. As the prince weakened, anxious crowds gathered to read the bulletins posted at Marlborough House. Sandringham, 9.30 a.m. Symptoms of great gravity have supervened and the condition of His Royal Highness, the Duke of Clarence, is critical. Everyone was sure he would fight off the illness, just as his father and brother had beaten typhoid. But the prince's temperature rose still higher, and he became delirious. His death was announced by black-bordered newspapers and tolling bells all over London. Prince Eddie had caught the popular imagination. He was quite a good-looking man. He was obviously a very well-meaning and affable man. He rather enjoyed showing off and preening himself in public. But there was a real affection for him and a feeling that the future might be his and he might make rather a better job of it than his father showed every sign of doing. Eddie's body was taken by train to Windsor in the snow. At stations along the route, crowds stood silent and bareheaded. Shops and theatres were closed in London, and there were many services of remembrance across the country. It was totally unexpected, the speed of the illness and his death. In him was probably invested the, the hope that most ordinary people had in the future. For the rest of her life, his mother, Princess Alexandra, made daily visits to the room where Eddie died leaving fresh flowers on his bed. But the people would soon forget about Prince Eddie, and just 18 months later, Princess May married Prince George. He would become king in Eddie's place, reigning for 25 years with Queen Mary by his side. The monarchy has not wished to draw attention to Prince Eddie, and because they didn't wish to draw attention to him, and for decades the country was very reverential towards the monarchy, and no one else particularly wanted to draw attention to him. George was crowned in 1910, and after a faltering start to his reign, successfully reinvented the German saxe coburg family as the English Windsors. It's now almost impossible to contemplate how different history might have been had Eddie lived. George did survive, George did become king. He was a much-loved monarch who lived for a very long period of time. If he had been a really bad king and brought the country to the brink of a republic, I think everybody would be going, oh, what a shame that Eddie died. Eddie would have been a good king. Yet George was not without failings. He was a shy man, cold to his wife, hard on his children. Andrew Cook's discoveries about the king's forgotten brother have convinced him that Eddie would have made a much better and more interesting monarch. Eddie was a very down-to-earth character, somebody who had an empathy with ordinary people that certainly George V very much lacked. He was a very remarkable character, uh, a million miles away from the perceptions that, that I started off with. Eddie, I think, would have been far more um, responsive to events, far more emotional, far more interested in the arts. But I think perhaps he would have taken risks, whereas his younger brother George, that's something George never did. Particularly if you look at 1917, where George V actually refuses to let the Tsar of Russia and his wife and his family seek refuge in Britain. I think quite a shameful episode in, in the history of the royal family. I only think Eddie would have let them in. I think he wouldn't have cared about you know, what, what people thought or, or, the, or the worries about republicanism. But as the reign of George V progressed, his older brother's reputation, like the picture of Dorian Gray, became ugly. I think you can trace back this trend to the first series of biographies on George V, on Mary, began to be written. 
the emphasis, I think, on authors at the time was, was to uh, pump up the image of George V as a king, as a monarch, as an emperor, by reducing and not exactly rubbishing uh, Eddie's reputation, but more or less to say in the book, aren't we lucky that George became king instead of his brother? I think that there's a big gap really between professional historians and popular historians if we're not careful. And I think that the fact that a lot of the stories seem to be vaguely true or, or completely false, bollocks as we'd say in the history world, yeah, to be a professional historian you do need to look at, at, at proper contemporary sources. You can't just go on repeating hearsay. But of course it's a lot more lucrative, you'll sell probably more books if you, if you go with the outlandish, the, the, you know, the exciting accusations. Most popular biographies about Eddie have drawn mainly on previous histories as their source material. Eddie was backward and utterly listless. He suffered a nervous tick and a piercing, unpleasant, high-pitched voice. There can be no doubt that he was pan-erotic. Many writers allude to Eddie's possible involvement in the Cleveland Street scandal, which had by now become public knowledge. One even describes Lord Arthur Somerset as Prince Eddie's close friend. Andrew Cook decided to investigate the one piece of evidence which appeared to link the two men, the apparent presence of Lord Arthur Somerset at the house party during which Eddie became engaged. There was an Arthur Somerset listed amongst the visitors, but Cook proved that the man at Luton Hoo was not the disgraced Lord Arthur, but an entirely different man. When I looked closely into the genealogy of the Somerset family, I found out that uh, Lord Arthur Somerset had a second cousin, and it turned out that the individual who was at Luton Hoo was the Honourable Arthur Somerset as opposed to Lord Arthur Somerset. But by the late 20th century, the myth of Prince Eddie in Cleveland Street had become so firmly entrenched that the facts alone could not dispel it. And Eddie such a monster that he was accused of being none other than Jack the Ripper himself. In the autumn of 1888, the bloody murders of five East End prostitutes had brought London to a state of panic. These women had been butchered, they'd been eviscerated. It was not, you know, they hadn't just sort of had their throats cut in a back alley, they had been carved up. It was horrible. Although grisly murders in Whitechapel weren't unusual, the killer was never caught, and his spree entered folklore. It took 82 years for Eddie to be fingered as Jack. By then, hunting the Ripper was an industry. Everybody's got a theory. You can walk down the street. They may not have all the facts, they may not know most of the facts, but you say to somebody, Jack the Ripper, and they say, ah, oh, yes, doctor, surgeon, wasn't it X, wasn't it Y? Everybody knows the name as a brand name. It's absolutely perfect. But when in 1970, an amateur criminologist by the name of Dr. Thomas Stowell made the sensational claim that Queen Victoria's grandson was the killer, it was soon reported around the world. The story of, of Prince Eddie, of course, is, is just an absolute winner. Anything that brings in royalty, scandal, prostitution, and wrap that up, and, and Prince Eddie, it would appeal to anybody. Dr. Stowell couldn't produce a shred of evidence and based his whole case on the prince's fondness for hunting in the Highlands. With his father's friends, he stalked dare on the family estate in Scotland. This gave him many opportunities of watching the dressing of the carcasses. In doing this, he would have learned how to remove bowels, heart, lungs and uterus neatly. Curiously, the murder of Annie Chapman in Hanbury Street, uh, the suspect is described as wearing a deer stalker hat. The name of the once obscure prince was now familiar to every crackpot and crank in the land. And a few years later, a BBC documentary broadcast yet more sensational claims. They were made by a man who said he was none other than the illegitimate grandson of Prince Eddie himself. My name is Joseph Sickert. My father was the painter, Walter Sickert. When I was a small boy, I can remember my mother telling me over and over again that I had to be very careful not to say anything or do anything, which would give the police or the authorities any reasons to question me 
or any excuse for them to take me away. Sickert said Eddie wasn't the killer, but the cause. He'd fallen for a Catholic, Annie Crook, wed and had a child. They met well, in Cleveland Street. That's quite a story. His claim is this would have caused a very major constitutional crisis, even a revolution in his view, and uh, the powers that be took action against anybody who knew or had an involvement in this scenario. For Sickert, the Ripper murders were not the serial rampage of a madman, but a heavily disguised attempt to hide the truth about Eddie's guilty secret. The assassin, according to Joseph Sickert, was the royal physician Sir William Gull. Soon, the best sellers and blockbusters were blaming Eddie. Several films followed, and the glossy big budget from hell was just the latest to put the prince's illicit liaison with a Catholic girl at the salacious center of a state conspiracy. Popular culture was rewriting history, and Eddie had gone to Hollywood. The Ripper accusations might have been risible, but as the final act in the defamation of a prince, they found a willing audience. It was Dr. Stowell's half-baked claims that Eddie was Jack, made over 30 years before, that started the ball rolling. But if you take the trouble to study the court circulars of 1888, you can plot an aristocratic suspect's whereabouts. Eddie's accuser had made the most elementary of errors. The big hole in, in Stowell's theory, of course, is that Prince Eddie was not in London at the time of any of the murders. And so unless somebody can produce evidence to show that he wasn't in the places that he's supposed to have been, he's got to cast iron out by. And on one occasion, he was dining with his grandmother, Queen Victoria. So that would be, you know, the alibi to cap all alibis. Prince Eddie's final resting place is long forgotten, in a corner of St George's Chapel, Windsor. When he died at 28, his brother took his crown and his bride. Later, Eddie even lost his good name. Yet the man and the myth are two very different things. Compassionate and able, with a uniquely progressive vision for his country, Eddie might have done things very differently. The House of Windsor, as it exists today, was very much George V's creation. If Eddie had been king, I certainly feel that history would have been very different, that uh, Eddie would have responded naturally to uh, the British public, and that the royal family we have today would be a very, very different one from the one we have. Perhaps that's the real reason why the memory of Prince Eddie, the king we never had, has been allowed to be so thoroughly besmirched. Tony Robinson travels to Normandy to uncover the truth behind the 1st Dorset Regiment, who risked everything on the morning of the 6th of June, 1944. A Time Team special D-Day next Saturday night at 25 past nine. Next, we're laughing all the way to the bank with Bremner, Bird and Fortune. Thank you.